Hi, I'm Bill Corcoran Jr. This is the On The Stacks Podcast. Oh yeah, whoa, look, they can never keep me down, I'm going, and if I ever fail to snow, I'll go again. I never quit, because I know that every loss may lead to another win, I'm going no. You know, I had a great gig. I, I was compensated while I enjoyed what I did, but I was like, I want to try something new. What's the worst that's going to happen? I'm not going to die. I could fail, right? I could totally go out and fail huge. But, um, you know, I knew I had my degree to fall back on. I, you know, got my PhD because I was like, maybe teaching will be down the road. But I just wanted to do a lot. And I tell people like who hear this, like, you got to think how many times in your life, and I've heard it from multiple people, I want to take that trip to Italy someday. Oh, that'd be fun. Okay, you said that five years ago. Why? You haven't gone yet. Like, think about it. Think about how many things in our lives that we have said to ourselves. Oh my gosh, you know what I really want to do? I want to go hiking at this place, blah, blah, blah. All right, you said that like six years ago. What's stopping you? Today, I'm chatting with Ryan Lecky, Emmy Award-winning content creator, storyteller, and owner of Ryan Lecky Media. This episode is brought to you by Burn, the fitness company behind the Today Show-approved Burn Board. If I'm being honest, working out can be a real chore, especially as a new dad in desperate need of sleep and cardio. Burn is founded by NEPA native Jimmy T. Martin, and his Burn Board offers a low-impact core and cardio experience unlike anything I've done before. They have hundreds of on-demand workouts that are great for beginners, seasoned athletes, and out-of-shape podcast hosts who love supporting small businesses. My wife and I use it pretty frequently throughout the week, and it's honestly a great way to burn a ton of calories without burning a ton of cash. Not to mention, it's a great tool for skiers, runners, wrestlers, and hockey players. Jimmy is offering all On The Stacks listeners 15% off when they use the code STACKS15. Visit theburn.com today to get 15% off your purchase with code STACKS15 at checkout. Again, that's theburn, T-H-E-B-R-R-N.com to get 15% off your purchase with code STACKS15. It's time to get on board today with Burn. This episode is brought to you by Blue Door Financial. Blue Door Financial will help you save money and reduce taxes to live a fuller financial life. To learn more, visit Blue Door Financial online at bludoorfinancial.com. That's bludoorfinancial.com. What's up, podcast? Episode 122 of the On The Stacks podcast here in the Blue Door studio. Welcome to the show, Ryan. How you doing? I, I feel like I've made it. I'm finally on the podcast. This is it. I've this been waiting is... like two and a half years for this, believe that it or not. long? It, yeah. I hope it's. I hope I don't bomb because then we're both going to be disappointed. I know, but yeah. I'm so excited because look, I have followed your journey, of course, on social media with the podcast, and I was telling people I was doing this. I feel like just being in this studio today. I'm like, where's my fake cigarette? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I feel like I've made it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, Bill, yeah. you, me, let's do it. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate you coming on, and I know this this time of day normally for you. Is like almost bedtime. Yeah, or so it used you, to be. You do your podcast in the evening. So yes. I mean, back in the day, I think you've asked me a couple of times. I'm like, Bill, I gotta go to bed. I know. I go to bed. I used to go to bed for 21 years at 6 p.m. and I would get up at 2 a.m. That's crazy. I had a huge nightlife. That's crazy. Huge. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah, a lot of dreaming. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I'm super excited to be here. And I said, hit me with any yeah. question you want. Nothing off limits. All right. Well, first question is actually. Who does the hair? Who does your hair? Do, but I want you to know, because I was so excited to come on today, I got a fresh cut in color. I thought I saw fresh that. Cut. This is one of, I'm like That's Cher. That's why I I'm asked. like Cher. This is one of my many natural colors. Okay. Wink, wink. Yep. Um, but if you ask who actually does my hair, shout out to my girl, Kate Howell in Dunmore, p and Hair Salon. That's your I've girl. I've been with her for like 11 years. Got it. She's my weavologist. Excellent. Got to keep it high and tight. But I was like, I'm coming on on the stack. Got to look I was fresh. Like, I got to clean it up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I gotta well, blow up the bouffant. Well, shout out, she did a great job. All right, well, I appreciate that. Yeah, checks in the mail. All right, <laughs> all right. So, so let, let's let's take it back. You know, you're you're doing something new now. Uh, you're no longer at WNEP, right? And a lot of people are probably wondering, like, what's going on? I know yeah, you've what's already, he doing? Yeah. I know you did already, he get fired? He yeah. got fired. <laughs> he got, I've heard so fired, many stories. I've I've heard um, he got fired. He moved out of the area. And I'm like, it's funny. I'm still here. Yeah, I'm here. He left northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, no, I didn't. You're still stuck with me. A lot of different things. Somebody yeah. said like I left and I went into teaching full time, which I guess, I mean, because I did go back to school and got another you degree. Could see that. So people yeah, could yeah. see that. Um, oh, and I moved to West Palm Beach, Florida, where my mom lives. So I'm allegedly living there as well. Okay. I'm everywhere. Transplanted yeah. everywhere. But the truth is, I'm here. 
You are here. Still in northeastern Pennsylvania. That's didn't right. Didn't go anywhere. Yeah. And I didn't get fired, so we'll unpack that. Yeah. By the way, did yeah. not get fired. <laughs> BTW. Yeah. 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 So, all right. So, we're going to talk a lot about, you know, your, your your journey and where you got and what you're doing now. But before we get to Ryan Lecky Media, which is what you're doing now, let's uh, kind of take me back. Like, where did where did the media start for you? Like, how, yeah. how did it all get started? On the Stacks. We'll be back in a flash after our word from our sponsor. Hi, I'm Jamie Anzalone and welcome to Access Anzalone. Another really key uh, thing that you can look for when you're researching somebody's website is to find a lawyer or a group of lawyers that lecture and teach on the area of personal injury law. Number one, it's not easy to be able to do that or to get invited to those seminars. And number two, to be able to do it means you have experience and expertise in that area of the law. In our firm, we have lawyers that lecture throughout the state and throughout the country. And if you've been in an accident where, as we said in the last segment, you are at one of your lowest points, you need a true expert. And teachers are experts in this field. And now we're back on the stacks. I have to say, too, I'm so grateful that you had me in here to do this because I'm always like, who? Who cares what I'm up to or whatever? And I'm blown away by like when you reached out to me and people on social media who still want to follow what I'm up to and stuff. I'm so grateful for that. So shout out to the peeps who may watch this and hear this, who have an interest in what I have to say and what I've been doing. Because sometimes I think in, in our lives, right, we leave a certain chapter and we're like, who's going to really care, right? I'm just yeah. going to ride off into the sunset and call it a day. And I was overwhelmed at the response from people when I left, you know, my first TV job, then this gig. And I'm like, you know, it means a lot. Yeah. So you asked the question, how did I essentially get here? Which takes us back to the story of how did I begin in television? Yeah. Where right. Did it because now there's this whole new world of content creation, social right. media, a lot different, and a lot of different things. But how I actually got my start in television, you know, I say flashback to when I was 13, 14 years old. I was born and raised just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in Johnstown, PA, also known as the Flood City for the big Johnstown floods. Um, so I started riding my bike when I was 13 and 14 to a TV station in my hometown of Johnstown, and it was WJAC-TV. So it was an NBC affiliate, and I used to go there, and I'd take my Trapper Keeper. Remember those? Yeah. Like, so I was, like, starting, yeah. I think it was right out of middle school and high school, and I had the binder and stuff. So I'm like, wow, I'm going to figure out a way to get a gig at a news station, and I'm going to go meet with the management, pitch ideas for teenagers to watch the news. Uh, fun fact, the key demographic in television was not teenagers at the time. And not now, 25 to yeah. 54 year old females was usually the key demo. So I would go there, I would take these ideas and wait in the lobby for the general manager. And the good news is I had some friends, parents who worked at the TV station at the time. Um, I knew the woman who worked in HR at the time. So she's like, oh, okay, you just wait. And the general manager, his name was Dick Schrott at the time, terrific guy. He'll come down and he'll talk to you about like whatever you wanna pitch, right? So I'd go in there, multiple times I'd go in and do my dog and pony show, right? Like, Hey, I have some new ideas, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like Valentine's day is coming up and here's some cool things kids can make for their like middle school sweethearts yeah. or whatever. Like I'd crank the cheese factor and they'd be like, Oh, okay. Okay. And as I mentioned, key demographics in television, not teenagers, but they were like, thanks so much. Stay on our radar. Sometimes we have part-time jobs that open here at the TV station. So we'll be in touch. Right. So when we say be in touch, I think as the old, um, HR person, she reached back out to me on Facebook because I did another interview with somebody about my new chapter. And she said, you really balanced the line of being persistent, a little annoying, but persistent. A little, a little annoying. <laughs> a little like annoying, that. right? Because yeah, yeah. I'd be like, hey, it's me again. Do you have any job openings? And they're like, uh, we just talked two hours ago. So no. Uh, yeah. So what happened was, so fast forward, I was going there. I was pitching my ideas for teens to watch the news. And, you know, as mentioned, they had a part-time opening that came about in the control room. So this was back in the day where we had tape loading, where we would plug in tapes to load the show. So a, a news story would be on a tape. So you would load like the five or six tapes while the show was live on the air. I did audio and cameras at the time so you know the robotic cameras I learned how to do some technical directing you would sit and do master control which basically is where you'd sit and make sure the commercial log was matching up and all the commercials were running and that the show was on the air and basically you didn't have black on the air that was your job so fast forward, did that for about six months. So I started in the control room at WJC TV, the NBC station right out of high school. So that's how if we just zip forward 13, 14 years old, nothing opened up. 
right out of high school, they had a part-time job opening. At the time, I was also working two other jobs. I was a lifeguard at a private swim club making $4.25 an hour. I was killing it. Yeah, wow. Um, I also lifeguarded at the Holiday Inn in Johnstown, PA. And then they got rid of lifeguards at the Holiday Inn in Johnstown. They just said, oh, we're just going to hang a sign or whatever. Screw people will drown. So (laughs) they were fine. They moved me to the front desk at the Holiday Inn. So I was navigating that and lifeguarding. And then this opening happened at WJAC. So I started working there part-time in the control room, really learning how to execute a newscast, how to get a show on the air, doing the behind the scenes tech work when a show was on. And then the hours just kept getting more and more. So I was like, well, I gotta cut back some of these other jobs. And also I should point out, I started full-time doing my undergrad while all this mess is going on in my life, right? So you're doing and by a lot. mess, I mean trying to figure out my career, right? Yeah. Um, going to school full time at the University of Pittsburgh at Johnstown, aka UPJ. So I'm a proud Pitt grad. That's where I did my undergrad. And long story short, things start, started picking up in the control room. So I was working more and more hours, pretty much almost full time. But then at the time, um, they had about three people leave the news department at once, so they needed help upstairs as well. So the control room was downstairs. I would go upstairs. I worked a lot of weekends. I worked weekends in this business for eight and a half years. Worked holidays for like 21 years, right? You never had a holiday off in news yeah. most of the time. So I would work weekends, um, holidays, and anyway, three people left in the news department at the same time. So I started one-man banding. So I would shoot right net at my own stuff. And how old were you? I was 18. This is when you were still 18. 18 in college full time. And then they needed more help like in the morning show. So I started getting up at like 2 a.m., 3 a.m. since I was like 18 years old, right, for morning TV. And then where I wasn't used in the news department, when I wasn't used then, they would use me in the control room. So I was really trying to be like the jack of all trades at the TV station. And a fun fact, people who worked in this market with me at WNEP TV, I worked with it my first job, which really brings me to the point of like, how much relationships matter with people. John Meyer, who's still at WNEP TV on Newswatch 16, now he's on the morning show, and Julie Sedoni, who used to work at WNEP TV, Newswatch 16, we worked together for like four and a half years before everybody came here. Oh, wow. And John Meyer is the one who told me about the job opening at WNEP. So and we can get okay. we can get there if you want to know, like, how did you leave your first TV job and then end up here? I can... I can unpack that. Yeah, unpack it. Okay. So I did my undergrad full time while I was basically working on the morning show at WJC TV. Because what happened was they needed more help in the news department than they did the control room. So my hours increased in the newsroom. And I was like a one man band. So I would go out and shoot, write, and edit my own stuff. And at the time, I worked really closely with John Meyer, who's here now. John was a great mentor to me. He was a great teacher. But on the weekends, we were a skeleton crew. It was really myself, John Meyer. We had a sports guy and a weather guy. That was it. So my job was to go out. I would sometimes start work at 6 a.m. on a Saturday, not finish till like 8, 9, 10 o'clock at night on a Saturday, work weekends all the time to really almost make up for those full-time hours. And I would go out and get all the stories, a lot of the video. Um, we called those Vosat, so it would be video, sound bites. Um, I would start voicing stories, which are called packages in the news business. So I started voicing stories where you would just hear my voice, but you wouldn't see me. And I don't know what they were thinking, because I look back on those tapes and I sounded like a 13-year-old like <laughs> yeah. girl, right? I yeah. was like, hey, the Super Bowl mm-hmm. party. And I'm like, oh my God, it's like this a mix of Ryan Mickey Lecky. Mouse yeah. meets Ryan. It was weird. Um, so they took a shot, right? They gave me a chance. I took advantage of the opportunity. And here's the funny thing. I was barely making like any money there at my last job. I would have done that for free. I can say that now because the experience I was on television when I was 18 years old, I solo anchored my first newscast when I was 19. I had the worst comb over. My hair was a hot mess. I had the worst highlights. Um, I looked like I was blowing out a of my comb clothes. Over? Yeah, I got a huge comb this. over. Um, I looked like I was blowing out of my clothes. Um, I was wearing like, I called it my big boy clothes, right? I had yeah. the, back in the day when jeans were sold and they were called husky jeans, I had a pair. Um, so basically, yeah. So basically found myself doing that and I was voicing stories. I did my first live shot when I was 18 years old, um, over the weekend when there was a huge news story that broke. And then I solo anchored when I was 19. And when you work in television, you know, I was getting my degree behind the scenes in communications. I think I might, my minor was in PR and marketing from the university of Pittsburgh at Johnstown. And when I was 21, before I left, I sent out 68 resumes and VHS tapes. So hopefully people remember what those are. VHS yeah, yeah, tapes. Yeah. So you would send out your resume reel along with your resumes. And I sent them out to 68 TV stations and I had three calls 
out of that. But this was back in the day when a lot of employers, you know, when, you know, employers had overwhelming amounts of employees and nobody was struggling for help, right? They actually took the time to send rejection letters back in the day. Like, hey, thank you so much for applying to our company. Uh, we reviewed your material and we decided to move in another direction. I had enough rejection letters to wallpaper a small bathroom. Tons of them. So I was like, okay, I guess uh, those, I don't know, 65 or whatever didn't work, but I got three bites. It was one bite. I forget where the one was, but there was one in like Sarasota, Florida, which was a much smaller market than here. And then WNEP called me. So they, I almost, they were I had one of three. One of three. And I have to say, I think John Meyer and Julie said on you were like, maybe bring this guy in. He's really driven. He has a lot of energy. Like, give him a chance. So they called me. I started here. Um, in 2005, that's when I moved to Northeastern Pennsylvania. But I feel like this is like my other home, right? Like I grew up and I'm a Johnstown PA native and I'm proud of that. But I also feel like I'm a Northeastern Pennsylvania native if that can happen, because I feel like this area just when I was 2005, just swallowed me whole and welcomed me with open arms. And I feel the love and I try to give it back. Like I just felt like these are my people and this is where I'm from. So oftentimes people will be like, Hey, where do you live? And I'm like, Oh, I'm from Scranton PA. And I'm like, well, not really, but you know, but yeah, you feel yeah, like it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's how I got here. And then, I mean, a lot of stuff happened when I first started here at this place. Yeah. Holy smokes. At right. WNEP, I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So uh, just take me back to when you were like 13 years old. Like what was yeah. the drive, the ambition, the passion behind you just showing up there, like asking for a job? Yeah. So I know when I was in middle school, this is back in the day when Katie Couric and Matt Lauer were on the Today Show. I would love, I loved watching the news when I was like in middle school. I would like turn down the sound, you know, when they would be like, this is today with Matt Lauer and Katie Kirk. Well, I would turn down the noise when they would say Matt Lauer's name and then say my name over. And I'm like, one day I'm going to be at the Today <laughs> yeah. Show. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe it'll still happen one day. Yeah. But I think for me, like, I don't have the passion for quote unquote news anymore. I still love telling people's stories, but um, I just loved like morning television specifically and news at the time, right? I think we all go through phases in our lives where you're like, oh, I love doing this. I love doing this. And then I think eventually you're like, I think this is where my talents are. And this is what speaks to me. But sometimes it takes years to figure that out. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how does it feel now to like be normally you're on the, you're on this side now. Yeah. This is opposite. How's it feel again? Be- I'm grateful. Cause I'm like, who cares what I'm up to? Right. Yeah. Um, it's awesome. It's been great. So, you know, I guess coming back to what we talked about, you know, getting to this side, was like 17 years at WNAP TV. And that's where a lot of people got to know me. And I was so grateful that they would let this hot mess into their homes in the morning, right? And you know what I think was so cool? You know, we had such a great clique of people and many who I still talk with. I mean, I still talk to Mindy Ramsey on the show. Tom Williams is a close friend of mine and we still talk. But a lot of us were together for, gosh, 12, 13 years. And in in television in general, anytime you have a show that has that kind of longevity, it's kind of unheard of. And we were together for a long time, but we were so close. Sometimes you would forget you were on TV. So coming back to the point where I was like, thank goodness people allowed this hot mess into their house, you would forget like you were doing morning news, so to speak, right? And you would start making jokes or cracking on yourself and then I'd be like oh maybe I shouldn't have said that you know (laughs) Um, but I think the biggest thing is in this area even though I wasn't born and raised here northeastern and central Pennsylvania was where I found myself yeah my true self I will so all right so how did so so take me back when you first started what was it like moving moving here oh my gosh scary right because I was scary in the aspect that oh my gosh I'm leaving my hometown yeah and now I'm gonna be three and a half four hours away from like my sister and my mom and and then eventually my mom moved to Pittsburgh and I'm coming to Scranton and I still laugh because by the way anytime people are like where are you from and I'm like Scranton the thing that jumps out of me I was so lucky I was able to interview Regis Philbin on his last season when he before he retired live with Regis and Kelly remember Yep. and I'll never forget so now when people are like where are you from so Regis just asked that question. I was like, oh, I'm from the television station in Scranton, PA. Literally for 10 minutes, he wandered around the studio going, hey, where are you from? Scranton. Where are you from? Scranton. Where are you from? Scranton. The whole time, right? Yeah. We would be in the middle of the interview and I'm asking like, I don't know, Kelly Ripa about something and the whole time Regis is going, Scranton. I'm from Scranton. Oh I don't know God. why, but that's yeah. what I think of when I tell people like I'm from this area. Um, so coming back to what you mentioned, I came here 2005 and I really... Uh, fell in love doing, you know, morning television, but I kind of felt like there was something missing in the morning show um, that maybe I could add to it when I came. So when I first came here, like a lot of morning shows back in 2005, a lot of it was like recapping, like, here's what happened last night at the city council meeting, right? I wore a shirt and tie. I so looked, that, that that's how it started. That's yeah, what you were doing? Yeah, so it started, I was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday morning. 
on the morning show. So I'd be up between like 2 and 2.30. At the time, we didn't have the 4.30 a.m. newscast, so you could sleep in a little bit. So I think I would get up at 2.30 or even 3 a.m. and you'd be at work at 4. So I would work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday on the morning show. And then my shift would change on the weekends from like 9.30 to 6.30. So, but even like on the weekends, by like 4 o'clock, I was like a zombie, right? I'm like, oh my gosh. But I was a news reporter Wednesday through Sunday. My days off for many years were Monday, Tuesday. Like, it was cool if you had to go grocery shopping because nobody was there. Yeah, but but that's about it. missed a lot of the weekend events, right? And I worked weekends for eight and a half years, and it was so funny when I would meet people who wanted to get into the industry, and everyone's like, I want to work Monday through Friday, and I never want to work holidays. And I'm like, get in line, right? I was in the business for 21 years, worked holidays, work weekends, and that's just the nature of the beast. So coming back to how my role kind of evolved, Wednesday through Sunday was a news reporter. But then I started, and again, it was the support of the people I worked for and worked with where I was like, hey, I have an idea. Why don't we on Wednesday and Thursday start promoting some cool stuff going on on the weekend, right? We got a pierogi festival, a kabasi festival, or some people call it kolbasi, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I love this area and all like the isms we all have here now. Yeah. Um, so I said, let's start promoting all the good going on in this area. I was like, there's so much happening. And oftentimes, what are we doing in the news business? Because I was working weekends at the time. We were covering it. And the stories were kind of like, hey, here's what you missed today. Look how cool. And I was like, why aren't we telling people ahead of time that this is going on in their backyard? So with the support of my bosses and, of course, the people I worked with on the show, they're like, yeah, let's do it. So we started promoting community events. But it could be fairs, festivals, special projects. And the funny thing is, I have to say, like in any industry, initially people from the outside, right? It kind of reminds me of the Brene Brown talk when she talked about the the Teddy Roosevelt quote. Like, if you're not in the arena with me getting dirt on your face and trying something new, like your criticism doesn't matter. I know when I started it, I did work with some people who were like, "There, you cannot cover hard news some mornings and something fun the next day. You can't do it. You have to choose. You have to be a hard news reporter or you have to be a features reporter. And I'm like, mm, no, you don't, right? Like at the time, you would yeah, look yeah, at yeah. Katie Couric, Matt Lauer, Diane Sawyer, Robin Roberts. One minute they're interviewing the president and the next minute they're jumping in a bounce house with Teletubbies, <laughs> right? But that was morning <laughs> yeah. TV. Yeah. But I really felt trying to lead that and make it a reality, which eventually became Lecky Live, the segment that I did for close to 17 years in this market, really showed people, and I think it's a credit to the viewers who counted on us every day. I always looked at the morning show and with our viewers, we're going to sit down and have a conversation at breakfast. And sometimes it's going to be hilarious and we're going to bust on each other and we're going to have a good time. But other times we're going to get serious. But the thing is, our viewers are very intelligent and they knew, hey, he's talking about a deadly fire. Like this is some serious stuff. Or, oh my gosh, look at the, I don't know, this the the biggest fair in Bloomsburg is going on and Lecky's there riding all these rides and that looks like something fun for this weekend. And we just did it and it worked. And then I had another news director at the time who was like, hey, this is really taking off. We should move you Monday through Friday in the show and you should be doing this Lecky Live stuff. And then we just started you know, covering more community events, getting schools involved, making, you know, tons of schools got involved and we made their students the star of the show and they had great things happening because here's the thing I noticed. And this is something I fought in the beginning from the naysayers, right? People, the news is depressing, right? People want to feel good in the morning. They want to feel like there's a bright spot in their community. And in this area, there is, there's a lot of great stuff going on, but I wanted to make it my job to celebrate that to highlight that and really to share the love and just throw that positive light that other communities were giving out, throw it back at them, let them give it out to other people and just show the good here at home. Because oftentimes we're like, hey, look at this fire. Look at this car crash. Look how bad the roads are. And you know what? The news is depressing. And it's depressing everywhere. But I'm like, people want to feel good. And that's where you saw network television putting Diane Sawyer and Robin Roberts with Teletubbies in a bounce house. But it worked. And people still respected them when they had to do a hard interview. And I did some hard-hitting stories and some of the biggest specials they had there in the aspect where we took the 6 o'clock news And we took 15 minutes of the half hour show and blew it up, right, for special projects. One of the projects I was really grateful for was telling the story, if you remember, of Trooper Alex Douglas. Remember the Eric Freed man on the Poconos and everything? And Alex, I got to know him, and he trusted me to tell his story. But we started innovating certain shows, and people knew, like, wow, I guess this guy has the news chops. But also, I could be hard-hitting when we had to be. And I could also be fun because here's the thing. That's what happens in homes and conversations around tables. And for me, that's what it was like around the breakfast table with our viewers. You know, sometimes we're going to be super serious and other times we're going to have a lot of fun. And people knew how to interpret that. Yeah, it was just real 
yeah. authentic content. That's it. Yeah. And you were just out there doing it. But I have to tell you, like a lot of things, you know, I hit walls along the way. I think people would look at my job and I think they see this a lot in a lot of different industries. It's not just TV, right? How many times do people meet somebody and they're like, oh, they're the CEO of that company, man, they have it made and look what they're doing. But what they don't see is them maybe like making no money, maybe, I don't know, washing the dishes at that casino they're now the CEO of 20 years earlier. Everybody has a story to tell. And I think sometimes what you see I don't want to say that's what we project, but sometimes what people see, like they would see me on television having a lot of fun, and I did have a great time at my job. But what they didn't see is that I was going to bed at 6 o'clock at night for 21 years. My partner would come home from work. My partner, Matt, from the last eight years would come home from work at 5.30, 5.45. He'd go to work, the gym, trying to tell me about his day, and all I would do was yawn. And I couldn't process anything. Like, and that was just my shift. That was my life. It wasn't like I, I didn't hate the place by any means for that, right? But I just thought like, that's what started getting me thinking in the pandemic. And we can talk about that as like, what does the next five or 10 years of my life look like? And it was just to the point where I just felt like I was missing a lot of my life. And I did everything I wanted to do at the station where I was. I was so grateful. Like, and that's the other thing. You know, people, as we talked about in the beginning, people heard rumors like he got fired. He moved (laughs) to West Palm Beach to be with his mom or I don't know. He's doing something else. But for me, like I wanted to go out when it was great and it was awesome. Like when I was still there, it was good. But I'm like, I really innovated my job as much as I could. I started as the news guy Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Then we took Lecky Live five days a week. Then we started doing community events, special projects. Then we rolled out Ryan's Run, the charity campaign that we partnered with Allied Services, and we raised almost five million dollars in twelve years, which is crazy for by kids the way. and adults with disabilities, which was amazing. Yeah, but I am so grateful because the management I work for at the station, the team behind the scenes. That's the other thing. Like, I want to say, like, I don't want to him ha like, oh, I had a hard life and I had to go to bed at six. Like, I didn't have kids to take care of at night. I looked at people like Mindy Ramsey, who's still on the show. I looked at people in our control room who were amazingly wicked smart people who would make me better, who would get in my ear and be like, dude, you pronounce that wrong. Get it right. Right. Who made yeah, me yeah. better every day. But some of these people were out at their kids ba- games or lacrosse games until like nine, nine thirty at night and getting up at 2 a.m. and going to do that show in the morning. And I give them such credit, you know, and I think that's what I'm coming back to is people would see like, oh, my God, you have the greatest gig. And I did have fun. But sometimes the most coolest part of my day was my actual job during that live morning show. There was a lot of prep work behind the scenes because sometimes in the summer I would book out three to four months. I'd be booked. But that was me building the graphics behind the scenes, working with an amazing photographer, photojournalist in the morning. Eric Granahan was great. Working with him to cut video ahead of time, prep all the show. I always said to people the easiest part of my job there was the actual morning show like the actual recording right the the live show like same with this like this isn't yes. live but this is the right. easiest part the easiest part of my job was the live show just showing up the hardest part was getting all the ingredients every day to bake the cake and it wasn't like a one-stop shop if i was doing a story with you and we were doing something on on a company you were affiliated with you know you're trying to go to a couple different areas to get video assets branding logos this that right That was the hard part, calling people back. And a lot of people, they don't want to talk to me in the morning to set up a live shot at 6 a.m. I was getting calls at 5 at night when I'm trying to go to sleep, and they're like, I have a question about that live shot on Friday. And I took the call and got back to people because I realized not everybody's on the 2 a.m. like lucky shift, right? I always love talking to people, though, at 6 a.m. to set up a live shot. And people who I worked with often, um, great PR people in this area, they knew if they wanted to get me and get on the calendar, they'd call me between 6 and 7 a.m. I was like on. But I think what it came down to, like, I was so grateful for the opportunities I had there, the people I met, the management who's like, you want to do that? All right, let's take a shot. Let's go do it. And the cool things I got to do, I wouldn't be where I am without that place or my first job. I always feel like, and this is any industry, it's not just television. Everything is a stepping stone and everybody you meet in your life, relationships matter. I can't tell you how many times I, I sometimes see people burn bridges from other jobs, right? Like if you hate where you work and it is what it is, like try to go out on a high note because I am amazed now that I left, people I worked with in my first job back in like 2001 or whatever, people are calling me. And people who I maybe interviewed, a CEO somewhere, maybe in 2007, now calling, hey, do you think you can help me with this? Or hey, I need some storytelling or video production work on blank. 
just how much relationships matter. Yeah, you never know. It comes right back around. You never know. And I was blown away by that. I mean, people who I worked with in other corporations, you know, I was at WNAP for 17 years. During that time, I was through like five sales, right? So some people say, some people go. But just people I worked with in other um, companies would call and be like, hey, I think I have a gig for you. I'm amazed by that. Like, right? Like I always say, it reminds me of the quote, like when people show up, and show you who they are, they are, believe them, and relationships matter. So for me, I always just try to show up with people and be like, look, you're going to get, I feel like I'm a happy yellow Labrador and I'm coming at you. And I totally get, sometimes this is a lot to hit you with in the morning, especially when I was like getting up at 2 a.m. and doing the show from 4.30 to 7. I totally get that. This was a lot. But I think people got me because they're like, that's what he's about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 100%. And, and as I mentioned too, what we said earlier, like, this is not maybe the area I was born in, but this is where I, I really feel most at home and where I found myself. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a minute. So so, yeah. right, so you said you found yourself here. What does that mean? Yeah. So that's something that I've talked about before with folks that when I felt like the love from people here after working on, you know, at WNEP and people would, you'd see them on the street. They're like, hey, come on in and have a cup of coffee if you were in their neighborhood for an event or whatever. I just felt like so comfortable in my skin here. So I was able to come out fully is a gay man in this area. And my main goal out of that, and it took some time, but really to show people, other people in the LGBTQ plus community that you can be who you are, show up who you as you are, and still have a successful career. Because I think sometimes people think you have to choose. And don't get me wrong, there are some towns and there are some places and some positions maybe where people don't feel that, but I think you have to put yourself in a different situation where you can show up authentically, wholeheartedly, and just be who you are. Show the good and show the mess and just own who you are. And I think people appreciate that. So when I came out, look, it wasn't like everyone was like, yay, we're behind you. I mean, 98% of the people who engage with me on social media were like, we're here for you, whatever. You want to love unicorns? Like, we got your back. Yeah, yeah. But there's still people, like, I get an occasional tweet here and there, like, I just found out you're gay. I don't <laughs> want to follow you anymore. I'm like, well, thanks for taking the time to write to me or tweet me, right? But I'm like, newsflash, it's been a few years, yeah, right? It's yeah, so yeah, funny yeah. that people, like, now just found out. And, They're like, oh, wait, wait a second. Yeah, what? what happened? Yeah. What I They're missed? like, I got the memo. Yeah. I got the memo. So I think that's the biggest thing that if I could encourage people. And I got a lot of sweet notes when I signed off at WNEP to explore this next chapter. A lot of DMs from people saying, growing up in, you know, sometimes people message me from Berwick to Bloomsburg to Stroudsburg saying like, I got to watch you on the morning show. And this makes me feel old. When I was in middle school or high school and knowing that there was a gay man who was out, proud of who he was, just let it all out there and had a successful career. You inspired me. Like I came out to my family. And that's what I tell people. You never know of the impact you're making and you never know who's watching you. So show up, be real, be all in because I was amazed by that. I just thought I was out here living my life, trying to show up as real as I can and people paid attention to that. And if I inspired one, two, whatever people to just come out and be who they are and not even saying come out as come out and just love your life just and be who yourself. you are. Yes, that was the biggest thing. That's it. Yeah. Real simple. So that was probably when I said I found myself that was it and people support me. And now I feel like the social media community I built. People have gotten to know my dog. They've gotten to know my partner and now and my neighbors like they become kind of iconic on my Facebook. I see they're like giving you like treats and breakfast, stuff. Breakfast. Breakfast. Like, yeah. yeah, I go over there for yeah. breakfast. It's been amazing because I'm sleeping past 2 a.m. So yep. sometimes I get up at six. Sometimes I get up at eight o'clock and yeah. you never know. Right. Yep. But that's the biggest thing. And I think the coolest part of this next chapter and we can talk about that is the relationships I built over the past 17 years. They're still evolving and still playing a role in my chapter today. Because a lot of people who I worked with over the past 17 years, I'm now working with them now, but they're clients. So, all right. So I want to go back. I hope back. that answered yeah. you, uh, answered a lot of the questions regarding yeah. my my TV shtick. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? So, so did you meet Matt here? I did. I met my partner, Matt, here. At the time, we were both like pretty into pretty big CrossFitters. We were into the big CrossFit fitness craze, right? Um, and, you know, we still dabble in some of that. So a mutual friend connected us. We've been together for eight years, which I always joke, it's like 28 and gay. Um, it's like dog years, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that's like a lot of people, right? Yep. Uh, no. So we've been together for eight years and Matt really has been the rock and the sole supporter of me for, to be able to take this next leap. Not sole supporter when he's like, okay, you can just sit home and eat bonbons all day. Like if anyone knows of Susie Orman, remember the financial coach? Yep. 
Matt's my, Matt Susie Orman, right? He's like, hey, you can like um, go do this next chapter, but you got to make money. We got bills to pay, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. No, but Matt has been super, super supportive. Uh, my family as well. But I think the thing is too, what I noticed, the relationships I built and getting to meet some, you know, CEOs of companies and leaders of all these different organizations. I had all these great sounding boards even before I left and made the decision, right? To say like, okay, I'm going to leave quote unquote TV. I still want to stay in some type of content creation. And I had all these great people I could call and be like, I want to bounce this off you. Do you think I'm crazy? And I want people to know the biggest takeaway from this. Okay. I didn't get fired. Right. They must've offered me my job for maybe 13 times. And I think the people thing is that people who don't work in the media industry in television, like a lot of media organizations, television news specifically, and other TV shows like Ryan Seacrest is under a contract in television news. You sign really big ironclad contracts that, you're, you're going to work for us. And look, I was taken care of. They took care of me. I was so grateful for that. You're going to work for us. And, but here's what you can't do. Like you can't go out and do a book. You can't just be like, Hey, um, I know I'm working here at WNEP today, but later tonight I'm going to go host the prices. Right. Like you got to get that approved. Right. right There's right. ironclad contracts and it's not just this place. It's every media organization in the country. And for me, I just wanted freedom, right? Freedom to just be like, I want to go out and try this, right? Because I had some people approach me for other gigs. And when you're under a contract and when you work for a news agency and um, you got to be careful of ethical concerns and decisions and all that other stuff. So for me, I was like, I just want that freedom. So if I have an opportunity to work with a production company who might be shooting a pilot show that could go to Netflix for streaming or Hulu or Amazon, you could be I, in. I just want to be, I want to be able to say yes. Yeah. And my general manager, um, before I left and the news director, they were great to me. As I mentioned, they offered me my job many, many times. And the last time my general manager, and she was great, her name's Julie Eisenman, we had a chat in her office. I just looked at her and said, I'm leaving here not because I need to earn more, but because I need to learn more. I just wanted to grow and try some new stuff. I mean, I did news for 21 years. And I think what's amazing, and I don't know if you've experienced this, but I'm amazed like when people heard I was leaving there and I've seen it with other people who are like, oh, I've worked at the bank for 20 years. I'm leaving. Why would you leave? Yeah, such a great job. You're, you're yeah, set. Why? why? Yeah, I, why? I'm going to shoot my shot. That was it. I wanted to go take a risk. I didn't want to be in my 40s and look back and say, you know what? What if I went and tried this? Regret. And I think so many people, regret is the worst thing. And so many people... I see it with a lot of folks because it's so easy and it would have been so easy for me to stay in my comfort zone. I was so comfortable at WNAP building the connections and the network that I built in this area. People were so great. I can call and be like, Hey, you want to meet me at 4am tomorrow? And we're going to do a live shot on Blake. Yeah. Okay. Like, Whatever you need, right? You can, no, but you yeah. can make it happen really quick. Yep. But it was just to the point where I was like, I want to be challenged in a different way. You know, because really when I was there, I innovated my job. And again, it's kudos to the management who gave me a shot to do it. Like they rarely put up walls because I'd be like, hey, I want to try this. Here's the payoff. Here's why I think it's going to benefit our viewers. Right. So I started doing the Wednesday through Sunday news thing. Then I moved Monday through Friday for the Lucky Live. We started doing community projects and special projects and behind the scenes of TV shows and all this different stuff. And then thanks to our amazing control room staff, I was like, let's bring social media to the conversation. Right. Let's try to engage our viewers. Let's purchase this technology we can get we our control room during the pandemic it was like soon after we had like this isolated studio i was able to use we made like a digital studio with a few things we got off of amazon like on the cheap right but yeah, it looked yeah. great on yeah. tv because they made it amazing you, you'd be amazed what you can do with green screens and stuff so we turned it into a digital studio where we made our viewers a part of the conversation then i was able to launch some other segments i did a segment called reasons to smile again another thing i was like we have amazing things going on in our area but we made it social socially driven where viewers would be like, this is something amazing. So-and-so is doing something great in Pottsville. You need to meet this person. And through a picture and a comment on Facebook or Instagram, I'd be like, reach out to me via email. I want to hear more about your story. So we were able to start getting in towns and communities. And here's the one thing I noticed. The blessing of the pandemic showed us a lot of different things. I think the biggest thing from a television standpoint, we were able to get into small smaller towns or communities maybe that would take us four hours to drive to right from music to wherever right or three and a half hours or because we have such a big viewing area through zoom technology giving people a google drive link to say upload your pictures so i can share the story about how your girl scout raised fifty thousand dollars to save her neighbor or whatever we were able to use technology to our advantage but still tell really amazing impactful stories 
on people here in Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania. So that was a plus during the pandemic because back in the day, no TV station anywhere would be like, wait, what do you mean you want yeah, to do this on Zoom? Yeah, can't do that. You can't do that. Yeah. You have to drive. Um, if you're in music, you need to drive two plus hours to Williamsport, do your interview, then drive two plus hours back, and then you got to spend time editing it. It was just a lot quicker, but we were able to get into smaller, I want to say towns and communities that often didn't get the spotlight, especially during snowstorms. Using social media to really show the different parts of our area where you know things were maybe more impactful with the weather compared to others, social media was great. But again, it was me and the team I worked with. We I innovated my job again. And then after you innovate your job so many times, again, at any company, you're like, okay, what's next? What am I doing next? What's going on? And then for me, I just realized like it was time. Yeah, so what, what was that? Like what at what point was that that you said like, I need to make a change. I think like a lot of people, and I mentioned this to folk, folks, and I, I almost feel like I'm clubbing a dead horse because I feel as though many other people experience this. For me, it was the pandemic. It was this wake-up call because the pandemic was like literally like, er, put the brakes on, look at your life, right? Can't go anywhere. You can't distract yourself with your friends. You can't go to the gyms because they're closed, right? Look at your life, and is this what you want to do for the next five or 10 years? Is this it? And at the time, I mean, gosh, the pandemic, man, we got really good with technology, the people I was working with. And I was amazed. We didn't miss a beat or a newscast. The team just rallied and we made it happen. But that was the wake up call for me that I said, okay, I've done this now for 21 years. Because people have to remember, I mean, even though I'm 39 now, people would be like, oh, you haven't been doing it that long. Why are you leaving? Why are you giving up this gig? I've been doing it since I was 18. Again, grateful for that. But 18, getting up at two in the morning, going to bed at six, doing that for 21 years, And God love my friends. Even on the weekends, they'd be like, let's go to dinner. I'm like, I'll meet you at three o'clock. Because at five o'clock, I was like, done. Done. Like, I was no fun at weddings. Like, we'd go to a wedding and be like 630. I'm like, Matt, I'm dead. I got to go home. I can't even keep my eyes open. Because for 21 years, your body just becomes. I'm still still surprised you're even awake right now. I know, but your body just becomes accustomed to it. So for me, that wake up call, you asked like, what was the little, the the glimmer that was like, okay, it was the pandemic. And I really thought after a while, you know, my contract was coming up, coming back to, you know, I, I had a three-year contract that was coming up at the end of May. And I was like, am I going to resign? And they did offer me my job. And I really thought about it, but I was like, you know what? I've done everything I can here. And I may leave here because I always thought it's time for me to launch my own company where I can, I wanted to do social media marketing. I wanted to help companies build stories around their people. And we'll talk about it, why I went that way. But for me, I was just like, this, this is, this is the time. And it's time for me to shoot my shot. And I steal that line from my old general manager because in a company meeting, she told everybody I was leaving and she's like, he's going to shoot a shot. And they were supportive. And the funny thing is I left there and here's the thing. I would go back there if they had a show like a deals and steals segment, they just needed like the fun host guy. Cause I pitched some of those, but right now it just didn't align and they're going through a transition as well with a new, new ownership. Um, but down the road, I said like, I, you got to keep those avenues open, right? That's why, I mean, I still talk to people from the old corporate office who became friends and mentors to me. I didn't burn any bridges. I wasn't mad when I left there and be like, okay, never talking to you guys yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. The relationships matter in Definitely. everything whether it's at the gym you go to, whether it's your company. And for me, I wanted to keep those alive, not just because I'm like, oh, this could lead to getting, because those people mattered to me. And I learned something from them. So I wanted to keep that going. So why burn the bridge? Yeah, so then what led me after I, my last day was May 27th. And I want people to know too, like I was an emotional mess, not only that morning, that entire month. Because I think the interesting thing, and I've talked to other people who've launched their own companies and who are small business owners, from the outside, right? Oh, look, you left and you started this new thing and it's going great and everything else. Like for a month and a half, I was like, oh my gosh, am I making the right move, right? I was an emotional mess. My partner will tell you, there was days sometimes he'd come home and I'm gonna be honest, I was wailing in the kitchen like, ah, like the last week there, I was like, how can I leave this gig, right? Like, what am I gonna do? You were second guessing yourself. Totally. What if I flop? Um, I'm also a big believer in like taking care of not only your physical health, your mental health. So I have a therapist who I've talked to on a bi-monthly basis, right? And that was a great sounding board to have that third-party perspective. But I really was a mess the last month. And I think it would have been really easy because I have seen as much as we want to keep relationships alive and everybody wants to leave on a great note, I have seen company co- people leave companies when they felt like they weren't treated well and they're just like, screw this place, I'm out of here. But for me, that's what made it so difficult because I love the people I work with. I found myself here. I mean, some of the, my closest friends, my coworkers are the ones I pulled in the hallway and I'm like, I'm gay. 
I'm gay. And they're like, okay, big surprise. Give me a hug, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know yeah. what I mean? But those yeah. are the people I came out to. Those are the people who supported me. Those people, literally, the people who were at WNAP were my family. And I was leaving that family after 17 years. That's tough. But it was a safe space, and I was comfortable. I was so comfortable. So the last month, I was an emotional mess. I it was like bawling some days. The last day I remember um, on the air before I said my farewell, and I was like, we just got to get to this tape piece. I was gripping Mindy Ramsey's hand, like ready to rip it off, right? I was a disaster because I think people looked at it from the outside. They're like, wow, that was easy, man. You just left after 17 years and you're done. You're moving on. Good for you. And I was like, it, it wasn't that as easy as it looks, you know? And there's still times where I have anxiety, like, oh my God, is this going to work? And then things click, right? And you use your network and, um, and things are going well. That's good. Awesome. Yeah. But I think the biggest thing is coming back to is just like, you know, I wanted to leave on my own terms. And it was such an incredible ride. And I wanted to leave when it was great. And who knows? Down the road, something could work out. I am still collaborating, working with people I used to work with who had since left there on other things. Stay tuned. There could be an Amazon Prime TV show dropping where you may see us. Um, That's I'll post that on yeah. social media. Yeah. But um, you know, I just I think the biggest takeaway is I just wanted freedom. So no contracts that could tell me what I can and can't do. And I just wanted to do different stuff. I wanted to go try shooting a commercial for somebody. So that's going to happen down the road. I wanted to do influencing work and brand partnerships. So this year, 2022, the end of it, 2023, the answer is yes. So when people are approaching me with organizations or companies that I really align with, I'm like, yep, let's do it. Sign me up. And I don't have to worry. Yeah. I may dabble back in the teaching sometime, you know, because I got my finished my PhD at Marywood in 2020, right before the world shut down, because that was something I wanted to explore again. But I just wanted this freedom of not getting up at 2 a.m. and not being under a contract. And they did offer me a different shift. But you know what? After 21 years of news, I covered enough snowstorms. I was good. I was like, time to go shoot my shot. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So you also mentioned mental health. Yeah. Why is that so important to you? Oh, my gosh. Well, that was the biggest thing to help me find myself, to just come out and be who I was and show up and look, some people are going to love it and some people are going to hate it. Right. And I always tell people, sometimes you might be too much for someone. And I love this one quote I saw. Sometimes I even tell people I am way too much for you. And if I'm too much, go find less. If I'm too much for you, go find less. Right. And that's for everybody because you're not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but the people who are in your tribe, who are looking out for you and have your back, those are your people. Right. And I get that. And I think mental health to me is so important because to have a third party, expert perspective, right? And now there's so many resources for mental health for people. So if, whether you have insurance or don't have it, there's so much information online and, and free hotlines and everything else. You need it, like, right? Because sometimes you have people in your inner circle who, I don't want to say always tell you what you're going to hear. A lot of the people call me out. Like if they think I'm BSing them, they call me right out. And those are the people you want as your trusted voices. But truthfully, I'm just such a believer in mental health because it got me through some really tough times um, when I was trying to be like, how oh, am I going to come out to my mom? I'm going to tell this person, right? And and now navigating the new chap chapter of like owning my own business. It's a whole nother, uh, yeah, whole other thing. Yeah. yeah, and I think people are scared sometimes to talk about it. I think people are ashamed, and I've noticed that because even leaders in companies, because people look up to them and they're like, oh my god, and they look at them again, maybe not seeing their journey to get there, but they look at these people who are running, you know, really big organizations and companies, and these are people who have confided in me, saying, you know, yeah, I go see a therapist like twice a month or whatever. But I would say encourage, tell your staff that, right? Like own your truth. You don't have to tell people like everything and overshare with them. But I think it's super important because it makes such a difference to have that outside perspective. And I'm such a believer in it. You Definitely. know, and I feel like yeah. people think you have to almost be diagnosed with something to go see somebody like, right? You don't have to be. Yeah. Yeah. You just go, just, just talk. Yeah. I kind of sometimes walk out of my therapist's office. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I feel kind of bad. Cause I just go in there. I'm like, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. word vomit everywhere. Yeah. 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 Cause yeah. I don't shut up clearly like I'm doing right now. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's good. It's, I appreciate, I appreciate you sharing, sharing mm -hmm. all this information. Super with me. important. It's, uh, it's, yeah. it's, I think it's very important. So decide you're going to leave. You break the news and you leave go, the station, not the area. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Leave the station. Yeah. Not the area. And, uh, what was the plan? So the plan was, and I was working on it behind the scenes, you know, in my off time, building Ryan Lecky Media. Because I said, what's my next chapter? One, I told you it involved, I want more freedom. I want to work with production companies and other shows. And if there's a hosting gig that pops up here and there, I want to be able to do it. I want to just go out and try everything. But I also noticed over the past, I, I mean, I've been here for in this market for 17 years. But over the past, I would say five plus years, as social media just kept getting bigger and bigger. I should say 10 plus years. I would run in the companies and they would see me doing Facebook Lives or Instagram Lives or Instagram Stories or Reels. And I was amazed how many companies, including their marketing, people were like, wait, what's that? What are you doing? What are you doing? 
and then, you, you know, I would create almost a story, right? Because that was my wheelhouse. For 21 years, I was a storyteller. I still am a storyteller. But creating that on social media through content creation. So, so many companies would be like, man, I wish you could teach us this, or I wish we could hire you to do blank. And then it got me thinking like, maybe there's something here. So what my company does, Ryan Lecky Media, and by the way, full disclosure, we've been so busy, we're still building out the website. We're planning maybe a big full launch in the fall, right? It's been busy, it's been great, but we are going into companies with my team and organically shooting their company, their people, and managing their social media platforms and making their folks the star of the show. Because how many times do you go into an organization, whether it's a healthcare company, or maybe it's um, a place that does like aesthetics, like fillers and Botox, and you're like, where is this place? Do they do this? I want answers to these FAQs. We do that. We go in there and we interview their team and shoot it as a story, right? But it's, it's a commercial. We're just still doing commercials, so to speak, but it's on a platform where people can go and get more information. And you're answering the questions. We're answering their questions because we see what their FAQ page is. But then I ask these people, the companies we're working with, what's one of the other big questions you get? Or what about this? If it's a healthcare company, what's the big thing? Oh, people think they need referrals to come here. Let's do a video on that. You know, people are really confused when they walk into a big building, what store to go into. Let's cut a video on that. Right. Or what goes on? You know, one of one of the companies I'm working for, they're incredible. They're a global company based in Oliphant. I can just say this. It's CanPack. They're amazing to work with. And they make aluminum cans for companies all over the globe. So the cans that you're probably drinking from in your refrigerator or while you're driving, while you're listening to this, they make those in Olive in Pennsylvania. But you know what was amazing? They're like, some people don't know what's going on behind the doors here. And you walk into this place and it looks like Amazon and Google had a baby. And when I first met these folks, I was like, there are so many stories to tell here. So for a company like that or for some other companies, we're building out stories around their team because we want their team to feel valued and a part of the show. And a lot of companies around here, they do great work with diversity and inclusion efforts. And they do things in the community to donate, to support local fire departments. But no one's out there telling their story and helping them essentially commercialize it, so to speak, right? Where people can realize, well, this is a great company I should support or maybe I should work here. We're helping a lot of organizations with recruitment efforts because right now it's an employee market, but a lot of companies are struggling to find staff. So how do you show the workplace in an authentic, organic light? You do that through real video real stories, right? There's a lot of great digital ad agencies out there. And what I found though, even by talking to some of the people we're working with, sometimes Bill's Tire Shop in Erie, Pennsylvania would get the same photo as Ryan's Tire Shop in Scranton, PA. It's very generic. It was generic, stock photos. It wasn't reflective of who they are. When we shoot videos, we shoot the facility, their people. Who's the person you're gonna meet when you walk in at the front desk? they're going to be in a video, right? Yeah. Not only that, but then building out different types of Instagram highlights. So it's easy for people meet our team answers to FAQs and getting companies on TikTok. And that's something I think a lot of people are scared about because they think TikTok, they think of their elementary school kids or middle school kids yeah, doing all dancing, these choreographed yeah, Janet Jackson yeah. dances. They're probably doing like, I don't know, Lizzo dances now. Stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think a lot of people have the misconception that that's what TikTok is all about. That's a huge part of it. But TikTok for, I think it's now two years in a row, has outperformed Google as a search platform. It's crazy. So more people are looking on TikTok for information or just content recipes, how-to videos, right? It's insane. But companies aren't on there because they don't know what to do with it. So we're helping to build that out as well. So where does one start? Like a company, like what are they... How do they start this process? With us? Yeah. Yeah. So essentially, you know, I tell people the easiest way to get a hold of me, I have a contact button on my Facebook page. My email is really easy. It's ryan at ryanluckymedia.com. But companies will reach out and I ask them to like, what are you struggling with? Right? That's the biggest thing. A lot, I could go in there and be like, oh, we can do this. We could shoot this. But I want to know what are you struggling with? And a lot of companies, it's hiring staff. It's the struggle to show like this is a great place to work and here's the benefits and rewards, right? Because it's one thing to put that on paper or in an Indeed post that's this long yeah, yeah. that nobody reads, yeah. right? So to go in there and tell their story. But I think the biggest thing is is building stories around their employees and their staff so they feel valued, they feel heard, they feel seen as part of the company because they are that company. 
And we want people to look at their social media channels and platforms. And then we're taking some of the content, we're doing digital ad placements as well, right? So more eyeballs get on that company. But to make sure people know, like the testimonial videos you see in, say, a place that does aesthetics, Botox fillers or whatever. Oh my God, that's Bill from Wilkesbury. Yeah, I saw I know him in the him. video. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but, but videos where people can see themselves in those folks. You know, we're, we're working with some other amazing attractions in this area as well. And we're building out content where moms can see themselves and their kids in those videos. That's what works with consumers. It's one thing to have a CEO of a healthcare company be like, hey, come here and we're great. We'll make your yeah. shoulders feel better or like whatever. But if we can build stories around their team from the ground up, right, where people feel really connected and that that reflects back to the, the audience watching it and then testimonial videos of maybe somebody who had a procedure done who came there and they're just like, I just love this place. And they literally fixed whatever it was that I needed, whether it was a shoulder issue, a nagging knee pain, or maybe I just needed Botox. Um, stories where people can see themselves in. Yeah. And connect to that. Definitely. So I think I saw you post on social media recently that you're looking for maybe freelancers. Are, I are am. And I, I have to say, I still am. But here's the interesting thing. And every company is different. So I jokingly said it, but it's really true. I'm looking for like the Swiss army knife of social media content creation. Yeah, explain that. So I put up the post and I was really specific. I said, yes, you have to be a great writer. You have to have great grammar. But you also know have to have to be able to edit on Video Leap, iMovie, Adobe, or Final Cut, one of those platforms, and tell a story. Because so many times people are like, "Hey, people applied, and I was grateful." But they're like, "I'm a great writer." Okay, cool. Can you edit video? Can you cut that? No. Well, that's what we do, right? So essentially, it's like having somebody come in and being like, "Hey, I want to work at your big shop. Great. Can you make cakes and muffins?" Mm, no, I can only do muffins. Well, I need you to make cakes. You're not the right fit, right? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I, we want, we are willing, I'm willing to help train and grow people because that helped with me, but you have to have some basis because nowadays there's so many free apps you can get on your phone to edit video. People can edit videos on TikTok, on Instagram, again, free platforms. If you can figure this out and you need a little guidance and help people who are great at making graphics, even if it's on Canva, motion graphics, like that's what I'm looking for. Literally, and some of the best like freelancers I have on my team, one is this mom of four kids and she's a rock star at Reels and TikToks and she's amazing and she's a phenomenal writer and witty. Probably one of the best hires. Perfect. Yeah, so that I am looking for the Swiss Army knife of social media content creation. So if you can edit, if you can write, if you can come up with really cool captions, if you know how to use Google Drive, yeah, reach out. Ryan go. at RyanLuckyMedia.com. There it is. All right. So so how do you, you know, I know a lot of people are probably wondering, like, where do you get this energy from, this high energy? And how do you stay motivated? Have you met my mother? I haven't. I always joke. So I joke that people sometimes think I'm like a yellow Labrador coming at you. My mom is like a yellow lab who maybe drank 12 cases of like Mountain Dew, right? Even though she doesn't drink Yeah, yeah. Seven pots got my mother with the minute her eyes are open in the morning. It's like, she is like, wow, let's go. Right. That's where I get it from. I think that's also a big part of my work ethic um, that I get from my mom and she's nonstop. But I think for me, here's the interesting thing. And my friends and my partner, Matt will tell you, I have two switches. I am on, I'm ready to go or it's just, and I'm done. And if I'm hungry, look out. I'm going to rip your lunch yeah, right out of your hand. Move out of the way. Yeah, but that's the thing. So I think my energy, I don't know, a zest for life, like waking up, being challenged, being fueled. Yeah, I drink coffee in the morning. But it was funny. Back in the day, people would be like, you know, when I worked on the morning show, people would say, how many bottles of coffee do you drink every day? I'd have yeah. like two cups, right? But I was also a really big proponent. I went to bed at six and got up at two. I had to get like seven and a half to eight hours to function. Now I'm getting like nine, nine and a half, and I feel like a new person. But I was really a sleep evangelist. Like I was like, I gotta get my sleep because I didn't have a job where you can tuck your head in, in a desk and hide all day, right? Like you had to be on because you yeah. had to function. And if you didn't, I knew the people I worked with were gonna bust my chops all morning, right? Yeah. Like you yeah. really just had to be on and know your stuff. So for me, I think sleep is so important and that's what I'm getting more of now. It's been great. And I'm so grateful when I hear from people and they're like, oh, we miss you on the morning show. And you know, I miss some of that stuff as well, but I don't miss waking up at 2 a.m. and missing my life. And I think coming back to what we talked about with the pandemic, if that taught us anything, it's about how relationships matter, how people matter, and work isn't everything. You know, I had a great gig. I, I was compensated while well. I enjoyed what I did, but I was like, I want to try something new. What's the worst that's going to happen? I'm not going to die. I could fail, right? I could totally go out and fail huge, but... um you know, I knew I had my degree to fall back on. I, you know, I got my PhD because I was like, maybe teaching will be down the road. But I just wanted to do a lot. And I tell people like who hear this, like you got to think how many times in your life, and I've heard it from multiple people, I want to take that trip to Italy someday. Oh, that'd be fun. 
okay, you said that five years ago, why you haven't gone yet? Like, think about it. Think about how many things in our lives that we have said to ourselves. Oh my gosh, you know what I really want to do? I want to go hiking at this place, blah, blah, blah. All right, you said that like six years ago. What's stopping you? And now for other people who are like, oh, I want to I want to try another job, but maybe not this year. This isn't the year. You know what happens? That record keeps repeating itself. And then you become one of those miserable old curmudgeons at a company where you like start phoning it in and be miserable, right? Because you're like, why did I just leave and go, no, I'm just, I hate everything. Yeah. Don't be that person. Back to the regret. Yeah. But I know people even, you know, people who I love and even my own family who've talked about, like, I want to go take this trip overseas sometimes. And I'm like, you said that seven years ago. What are you waiting for? Just go right? do it. Yeah. And that's it. And I always say, you'll, you'll figure it out. And a great quote that really sticks with me, and I tell people, if they take anything away from this chat, I tell people, like, go shoot your shot, right? If you wanted to go, if you're miserable in a relationship that's not working for you, do you want to look back and say three years I'm still in it because I was just comfortable and I didn't have the, the, the balls to just take the leap and get out of it? It's the same with your job. And it's a great quote that reminds me of Mel Robbins, who's a leadership expert. And she had this great quote. She was, did several videos on it. And it's so important. No one is coming for you. Nobody. And she said this, and it really got me thinking. Think about people right now if they're listening to this like, oh, I want to be an actor someday and I want to go to New York and I want to, no one's coming to find you to put you on Broadway. No one was coming to find me to fill Regis Philbin's spot. I'm still knocking down doors. I'm still calling people, right? To see how do I get to do something like that? Because I'm exploring a lot right now, but I think in all of our fields or everything we want to do in life, you have to like take charge and you got to honk your own horn or no one's going to hear you're coming, right? Like, because nobody's coming to find you. And that's a that's a really hard truth for a lot of people who, I want to be an actor. Oh my gosh, you know what? I, I kind of wanted to be an electrician for a while. Okay, did you sign up? Did you go to HVAC school? Did you figure this out? Well, no, not yet. No one's coming to find you. No one's coming to track you down to make your dreams come true. And for me, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go take this risk. It could flop. But what if it's great? You know? What if? Yeah. Yeah. And that's the biggest thing. And I think how many times do we meet people, whether it's taking that vacation, going to try out for a community play, right? Like, just go live your life. Just but, go do but, it. But no one is going to come and pluck you out of your little comfort zone and say, like, you know what? I want to make you um, an overnight sense. It's not happening. It doesn't work like that. You got to hustle and you got to hustle hard. And you're hustling. I'm trying every day. Every you day are. I'm hustling. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But again, I'm grateful because the people I'm working with, they're giving me a shot. I'm not saying I'm walking into every company or I don't walk in every meeting that I'm going to have with people who are in a call and they're like, yeah, okay, let's do it. You're hired. It doesn't always happen. That's the other thing as a business owner now. And it's so weird when people are like, oh, you're an entrepreneur. And I'm like new to that word. Yeah, yeah. But I've been rejected a lot, you know? And it's funny because I'm like, hey, I think we could do this. They're like, mm, no, thanks. You know? Yeah. And it's interesting. What was that like for you? Initially, it was hard, but it was, it's a lesson, right? And it was such like a learning experience, this whole thing, launching a company. And somebody, you know, I have a lot of friends who are like small business owners. I have a whole new respect for it. But for me, I think why I loved it so far, and I'm loving this journey and this new hustle, I didn't know anything about launching a small business back in January when I really started thinking about this. Nothing. Like, I'm amazed because people are like, wow, you really have a good business sense and blah, blah, blah. No, I'm terrible with money and finances. So I hired somebody who's a business manager and who's a wicked accountant to be like, um, stop blowing your money, right? That's what I did to make sure. Plus, I live with Susie Orman, so he keeps an eye on the finances. Yeah, yeah. I know what my strengths are. My strengths are creativity. It's storytelling. It's making people feel comfortable in front of a camera. It's making people look their best, feel their best, and being able to tell their story and make it look great, right? That's my strengths. There's a lot of stuff. I had no idea. How do you set up an LLC, right? I got lawyered up in January. I had people guide me along the way. Shout out to Joe Kluger, by the way, from Horgan, Kluger, and Quinn. That's my guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, phenomenal. People, though, who were great, but who were straight shooters with me, right? Yeah, I could call absolutely. me like, hey, I want to do this. Here's why you're not going to do this, because this is what could yeah, happen. Yeah. You know, so surround yourself. And again, it's because of the people in this area, the people I've met along my journey. That's why people are like, oh, you glad you left that place? I will forever be grateful to WNEP the opportunities I had there because that set me up for this next chapter, right? The first job set me up for NEP. NEP set me up for this. And who knows what this is setting me up for next? Yeah. What and is that's that? what I, who knows? Stay tuned, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, 
That's the biggest thing. So I just tell people, like, go shoot your shot. And I know sometimes people are like, oh, it's, it's easier said than done to get out of, you know, to do this. Otherwise, you're in your comfort zone. And I really think if you sit back and listen to it, instead of just all this lucky guys telling me to go take a risk, think about it. In a year from now, write it to, are you still in the same spot? And if you're comfortable with that, because there are people who love what they do and they're okay. If the year comes around and I'm still in the same spot, I'm still doing the same thing, I'm still grinding the same way, that's great. And I'm still here to support you and cheer you on. There's nothing wrong with that. I knew a lot of people in my life who I admired. I'm like, oh my God, you've worked there for 25 years and you love your job. Like my my one friend's mother worked as um, like a food service worker in a hospital for years. She retired. She loved the people she worked with. She loved what she did. She retired and went back. She missed it so much. She missed the people. But I admired that. I'm like, God, if everybody could find that. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, and it reminds me of the U2 song. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. That's where I am, right? I'm finding things that are really fueling me, but one thing is leading to the next. And I feel like it's all about growth. And for people who hear this, I think if you're in your 20s and your 30s, gosh, when I was 20, I thought, okay, you're going to be at a network by the time you're 22 and you're going to have a job and maybe you'll be, I don't know, the next Charlie Gibson or, you know, by the time you're 30, that didn't happen. But I'm almost 40 and I'm still figuring stuff out and I'm learning along the way and I'm taking a risk. But I think the thing is, I would say to folks, use your resources, use your trusted voices and use your contacts because I think that's the other thing. People are so scared to ask for help or people are afraid to admit when they don't know anything. That's helped me out a ton. I'll call and be like, I have no idea how to do yeah, this 1099 yeah. form or blah, blah, blah. Oh, we got this expert. She's an accountant and business manager. You should call her, right? She's really great. Um, shout out to Debbie Perry. Uh, but you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and I'm giving like all these shout outs, but it's amazing how one person leads you to the yeah, next. All you gotta do is ask. That's it. And don't, and I'm amazed how many people are afraid to ask those questions. Crazy. Be like, Bill, I need help on X, Y, and Z. Do you think you can help me? Like, what are you ashamed of? Like own when you don't know something. That's why I think I enjoyed and I was successful at my career in like broadcasting because to get a story on a topic that maybe was confusing, you had to track down an expert, but not only interview that person, digest the information and be able to spit it back out in a way that everybody could understand it. Yeah, make you sound like you know what you're talking about. And that was my right? wheelhouse, right? Yeah. Like being able to take something that was a super complex topic, breaking it down and making sure people got it. And that brings me back to like, if you don't know what you're doing for your next step, okay, maybe you're struggling to get out of your current job and you want to work in X company over here. Find a career coach, find a career mentor, look on LinkedIn. I mean, I met a lot of people. Uh, one of my favorite career coaches who I've worked at this in this area, Bill Leonard from Leonard Workforce Solutions. The guy was amazing because I'd be like, Bill, I don't know how to do all this, blah, blah, blah. Or this is my resume. And he'd be like, we're going to revamp this, right? And taking the leap and, and, and hiring people or working with people who are experts in their field, right? Like if I, if you want a great meal or something, else, like you're not going to ask me to cook it. You're going to go to a place that's known for it, right? Or you're going right. to go to a chef who knows what they're doing. And that's what you have to do in your life. Absolutely. Even if it's planning that dream vacation you've been putting off for five years. Right. Go to the person who does this every day. Yeah, definitely. That's great advice. Yeah, well, I hope so. Yeah. Hopefully nobody tuned out yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is great. I uh, I appreciate it. Any you. last minute questions? I feel like we're getting fired up now. Yeah. Oh, geez. We got like, we still got like two more hours to go here. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I was like, <laughs> yeah. no, I'm kidding. Yeah, I'm joking. Yeah. I'm joking. Yeah. Well, no, this is, uh, this is great. I mean, you know as from one storyteller to another it was uh it was great to i you hope know, so you're you're like a you're like a og storyteller and uh, i appreciate the opportunity that you gave me to to you know interview you today. well i again i when you called me i was like wait you want to talk to me about what you what do you care you you want to hear what i'm doing yeah so you know and look i still love sharing um great things around this area i love to engage with people so i love to connect on social media at ryan leckie r-y-a-n-l-e-c-k-e-y -E there's a ryan leckie in ireland on facebook that's not me Use the blue verify check because sometimes people are like, I found this Ryan Leckie on Facebook and he's at all these pubs. <laughs> not yeah. me. Yeah, not you. Not me. You're still um, here in any piece. But I, yeah, I'm still here. I didn't go anywhere. I still live um, in like the Dunmore Troop area. Uh, I'm not going anywhere. You know, I'm going to be traveling and doing some shoots here and there for some other companies, but I'm still here. I feel like an OG of Northeastern Pennsylvania. You are. Yeah. And it's all because of the cool people, you know, here in Northeastern and Central PA. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I wish you the best of luck. Well, I appreciate it. And I it. feel like you and I will probably cross paths again in the content world yeah i'm just excited because i'm staying up past my bedtime yeah normally we'd have to talk at like 6 a.m right yeah, yeah. this has been a win this for is everybody. like opposite time yeah. Yeah. i love it and look i'm grateful for this opportunity i'm grateful um for the people if they listened the whole way through <laughs> yeah i hope so too yeah because sometimes yeah. i think after you know and i think everybody goes through this when you finish something important right or a chat and i'm sure you've been through this you're like i want 
wonder if anybody even listen to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so all right. So, what's the best way for someone to connect with you online? It's really social media. Social media is the best, and that's the thing. Things are blowing up in a great way, and have been so busy with my new chapter, Ryan Lucky Media. The website's not done, but look, we're moving and shaking. We got examples we can provide you of what we can do for companies. Um, and I was waiting for you to say, "We." What do you have a mouse in your pocket? You're yeah. the only one yeah. here. Uh, no, I'm working with a great team of people, and Ryan at RyanLuckyMedia.com. My email button is right at the top of my Facebook page so you can connect with me there or you can connect with me and um, like some people are just like hey I hate the way your hair looks today and I just want to tell you I'm cool with that too whatever you want I think it looks good though bring it on yeah. bring it. I got this done just for you today by the did way did you yeah. yeah fresh cut and color appreciate it one of it. my many natural colors yeah but what I feel is- like my tan in the can my eyebrows are a little orange today are I'm gonna they? own that I'm just gonna own that yeah you're like you do look a little tan today a little tan in the you didn't can. have to admit that because I don't think people are gonna be able to notice that I'm fine with it though but maybe I told this you is my life when you called me for this you're like what can we talk about I said anything you want my life's an open book yeah I, I have no secrets that. and I'm still grateful people actually they care what I'm up to and that means a lot yeah so excellent more of this on social media <laughs> more of that yeah more realness yeah right that's it I like to say it. rock star realness what you get is what you see excellent all right Ryan Leckie on the Stacks Podcast in the Blue Door Studio. Thanks for joining me. Thanks so much. And now we're back on the Stacks. 